Today, we will learn and reflect on the Iliad by Homer. You may ask, how can we benefit when we ponder the Iliad? We cannot truly understand the culture of the ancient Greeks and Greek philosophy, culture, and history, and also the Western philosophical tradition without becoming familiar with Homer's works, the Iliad and the Odyssey. At the end of the talk, we will discuss the sources we use for this video and any additional lessons we learn from these sources and my blogs that cover this topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Sometimes these generate short videos of their own. Let us learn and reflect together. All ancient cultures were warrior cultures out of necessity. War was a, d a deadly business. If an ancient state lost the war, often the men would be slain and the women and children would be sold into slavery. Most of the slaves were either captured by pirates or enslaved during war. The gods would help in the battle, as we can see in Miriam's Song of the Sea. And it goes like this, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he is thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might. And he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. His picked officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered him. They went down into the depths like a stone. And we could see this ancient belief that Yahweh, the warrior God, fought on behalf of the Israelis. And you can see in the Iliad, where both the Greeks and the Trojans had the gods tipping the balance of the battles and sometimes joining in the battles themselves. And Elizabeth Van Diver, a professor with the Great Courses, who has some excellent series of lectures on the Iliad and the Odyssey, she tells us that the Homeric warrior fights for honor, or team A, glory or fame, or kleos in Greek, or geros in Greek, booty, gifts, or a particular prize. Kleos, glory and honor, serves as the only true form of immortality available to Homeric heroes. They live on what people say about them after they are dead. This is best expressed by the Trojan warrior Hector when his wife Andromache begs Hector not to return to the battle. The Trojan warrior Hector answers, I would die of shame to face the men of Troy and the Trojan women trailing in their long robes if I would shrink from battle now a coward. Nor does my spirit urge me on that way. I have learned it too well to stand up bravely, always to fight in the front ranks of the Trojan soldiers, winning my father great glory, glory for myself, for in my mind I know this well. The day will come when sacred Troy must die. Hector fears that the worst will come. Hector fears that when the walls of Troy will tumble, that his precious Andromache will be carried away enslaved. Hector fearfully tells his wife and queen, there is nothing, nothing besides your agony, when some brazen argive hails you off in tears, wrenching away your day of light and freedom. Then far off in the land of Argos you must live, laboring it alone at another woman's beck and call. Perhaps, since Andromache is a queen of Troy, Hector hopes you will only work the loom, but the myth of Troy tells us that she was forced to be a concubine of a minor Greek king, Although she eventually became the queen of Epirus, quite likely because that's a better ending for a queen in a myth. The concept of conscientious objectors refusing to serve in the army or navy because they opposed killing was totally unknown in the ancient world. It was totally absurd. In the Greek city-states, all free men were expected to serve in the military. In the Greek military system, the infantry formed a shield wall on the front line that required constant military drill and discipline. We read how Socrates himself took pride in his military service opposing the Persians in battle. Uh, we discuss and compare the warrior cultures of the Iliad and the American Indian in another video, which will be linked at the end of this video. The similarities between the two cultures are remarkable. Both cultures, the Iliad and the American Indian, contain tales of women captured and forced to be wives and concubines. Uh, Professor Van Diver also points out that the gods of ancient Greece were very different from our conception of a monotheistic, all-knowing, all-powerful, always-compassionate deity who takes interest in the affairs of mortal men, even counting the hairs on our head. The gods of Greece were like men, except they were immortal, but since they could not die, they could never gain glory like men in battle. 
The gods in the Iliad could be kind, they could be vicious, they could be magnanimous, or they could be petty. They could seem more like men, or they could even personify the weather, and they could go from here to there in an instant. The gods were immortal, but they were not omnipotent, nor were they omniscient, but they could be wounded, though their wounds could be always healed at Mount Olympus. It is clear in the Iliad that the gods take a great interest in kings and princes and great warriors, and are particularly interested in the events of the Trojan War in particular. Many mighty warriors in the Iliad, like Achilles, have a god for their mother or sometimes their father. In the Iliad, the gods come to earth in disguise to visit this mortal or that, or even fight in the battle next to their favored mortal combatants. Are the Greek gods interested in the affairs of ordinary little men, like the farmer, the slave, the poor man? Well, not so much. Little people may offer sacrifices to appease the gods, to save them from the capriciousness of the weather in war and life, but uh, nobody thought that the Greek gods would listen to them. The closest we come is the Roman Stoic philosopher Dio Chrysostom saying we should sacrifice to the gods, whether we think it does any good or not, because it is a good thing to do. We will discuss now the background of the Iliad and how the Iliad and its companion work, the Odyssey, reflect and influence Greek culture. Both of these works were recited orally, probably in public religious festivals, for centuries before they were written down. The Iliad covered a period near the end of the uh, Trojan War, while the Odyssey recounts the adventures of Odysseus as the gods delay his return home to Ithaca by many, many years. Archaeologists are not entirely sure about the Battle of Troy described in the Iliad, and this would have been ancient history for the Greeks. This war would have occurred centuries before in the Bronze Age. The Achaeans and the Iliad would have been Mycenaean Greeks who have left uh, archaeological artifacts, so we know they existed. And we know the Mycenaeans spoke Greek because the work of the scholar Michael Ventris uh, was able to translate the Linear B script, which is about the only time a scholar was able to translate a script that didn't have a code breaker like the Rosetta Stone where you had the identical script both in Greek and in Coptic and in uh, hieroglyphics. And he was able to do this because he guessed that the Mycenaeans spoke Greek and so he was able to break it that way. And he probably guessed that uh, most of the Linear B tablets are inventory tax lists. And unfortunately no Linear B literature has ever been found. After the Mycenaean Greeks came the Greek Dark Ages and the Greeks lost literacy, and they would not adopt another alphabet for several centuries. And you can see here a reconstruction of a Mycenaean ship, possibly the type that went to Troy. And we can see from this fresco that the Mycenaeans employed chariots, probably in Asia Minor. Now the mainland Greeks who recited the Iliad had no use for cavalry, since Greek is mountainous. The Greek armies were infantry forces. Only the Macedonians under Kings Philip and Alexander the Great had cavalry forces. Professor Kenneth Harrell of the Teaching Company quips that since Homer didn't understand how chariots worked, his Greek heroes used them as taxi cabs to reach the battle lines. We do know that Troy exists because it was excavated by Heinrich Schliemann from 1871 to 1879. He was able to locate the mounds containing the remains of Troy using the clues from the Iliad itself. He was not the first to excavate Troy, but he was the first to generate a lot of publicity for the project. Now, not only was his digging destructive, he violated his agreement with the governments of Greece and Turkey and smuggled many priceless treasures back to Europe. Also, most of his artifacts were from an older layer than the Troy of Iliad, but whatever he did dig up, he claimed came from the age of Agamemnon, like you see this mask of Agamemnon, which is probably quite a bit older. And we see Priam's treasure and the jewelry he put on his wife to wear from Troy. You can see where Troy is located. It's in Turkey, near the Dardanelles and Bosporus. According to tradition, the Iliad and the Odyssey were composed by the blind poet Homer. Scholars agree that the Iliad and the Odyssey were recited orally as epic poetry for centuries before they were written down. Some scholars speculate the ancient Greek was influenced more by the Iliad and the Odyssey than English was influenced by the Bible and Shakespeare. 
Now, how could bards memorize such lengthy poetry? I mean, like the Iliad and the Odyssey both took three full days, three full eight-hour days to recite. The scholar Melman Perry studied how bards in Yugoslavia were able to memorize long epic poetry. And they used memory aids that we can see in the text of the Iliad and the Odyssey. In the original Greek of the Iliad, the bard used standard phrases for your activities like eating and fighting and praying. And also standard phrases were used for each main hero when the various Greek noun cases were used. For example, he used unique adjectives when the names of the heroes were used as subjects or the objects of verbs or objects of prepositions, etc. And what I'm getting at is Greek is like German. Not only are the verbs conjugated, but the nouns are also declined according to the subject of speech that they have. And what this means is, for example, like Iliad, the very first word in the sentence uh, of the first line is rage, because the rage of Achilles is what the Iliad is all about. Was there an actual bard named Homer? Was Homer truly blind? Scholars debate these questions. We do know that any poems recited orally evolve over time. And we also know that both the Iliad and the Odyssey have a consistent style throughout. Although there are apparent contradictions in the Iliad that may suggest multiple sources. Or maybe there are two Homers, since the Odyssey reads more like a modern novel. Or maybe this consistency in each work is due to a redactor that edited the works when they were first transcribed in ancient Greek. We really don't know. We do know that there were multiple epic poems that were delivered at re the religious festivals covering the Battle of Troy, though only the Iliad and Odyssey have survived. However, all ancient sources agree that the Iliad and Odyssey were by far the best of these epic poems. Nearly everyone who listened to these recitations knew the basic plot beforehand, so the bard could only create suspense by how he told the story, because all the listeners knew the plot of the story. We need to be aware of the complete story to frame the Iliad, as it starts in the middle of the conflict of the Trojan War. Cicero speculates that the Iliad and the Odyssey were transcribed during the rule of the tyrant Pisistratus in the 6th century BC, which is over a century before Plato. Now, Dr. Wikipedia agrees with Cicero, but Cicero was four centuries removed from this time, so exactly when it was written down is anyone's guess. This is the basic plotline of the complete saga of the Battle of Troy uh, from Professor Van Diver's study guide. Uh, number one, the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen, daughter of the great god Zeus and wife of the Greek Menelaus, was abducted by the Trojan prince Paris. And uh, number two, under the command of Menelaus' elder brother Agamemnon, the Greeks mustered an army to go to Troy and fight for Helen's return. And the war against Troy lasted for ten years, and we see in boldface uh, the time period of the Iliad, which uh, the Iliad starts with the fighting being fairly evenly balanced. Each side has its foremost warrior. Achilles was the foremost warrior for the Greeks, and Hector was the foremost warrior for the Trojans. Achilles was the son of a goddess mother, Thetis, and a human father, Peleus. Their wedding was arranged by Zeus, but Thetis was not entirely willing. The greatest warrior, Hector, was killed by the greatest Greek warrior, Achilles, in the Iliad. But after the time of the Iliad, Achilles was himself killed by Paris, although the Iliad constantly refers to his mortality, so we do know that he will die in battle. Finally, the Greeks resort to trickery, using the ruse of the Trojan horse invented by Odysseus. They infiltrated the walled city of Troy and sacked it at night. And during the sack of Troy, the Greeks committed many outrages. Foremost among these outrages and acts of hubris was the killing of King Priam at his household altar, the murder of Hector's baby son, Astyanax, from throwing him from the city walls, and the rape of Priam's daughter Cassandra in the virgin goddess Athena's temple. These outrages angered the gods, leading to many hardships for the surviving Greeks on the way home. Most importantly, Agamemnon was killed by his wife and her lover when he arrived home, and Odysseus spent ten years wandering on his way from home from Troy, and this Adventures of Odysseus is in the Odyssey, and he also refers to the uh, killing of Agamemnon by his wife.
If we try to imagine what it must have been like to listen to these epic poems being recited by a bard in a Greek theater during the religious festivals that perhaps were staged from dawn to dusk, we can speculate on the structure of the Iliad. Many have wondered why the Iliad tells us of the arrival of the ships from Greece to the shores of Troy when the Iliad begins in the tenth year of the war. Likely, citizens from each of the city-states sat together in the amphitheater. Maybe they waited until the ships from their city-state was mentioned so they could cheer them on. The Iliad had a tremendous influence on Greek culture and literature. The Iliad was quoted extensively in all Greek literature and philosophy, including Plato. It is so well known that Greek authors could place one-sentence allusions to the Iliad in their works, and all Greeks would know where the allusions came from. Greeks who attended the religious festivals likely heard these epic poems sung by bards dozens of times over their lifetime. These poems have influenced uh, our culture up to the current day. Some of Shakespeare's plays were derived from the Iliad. In a warrior society, the greatest sin of a warrior was to commit hubris, the overwhelming arrogance, the overconfidence offending the gods, the foolish act that grabs defeat from the jaws of victory. In one respect, the Iliad is like the book of Genesis. The Iliad describes an archaic time when the Greek heroes not only talked to and fought with the gods physically, a few of the heroes were even offspring of the gods. For example, Achilles was the son of the goddess Thetis, and the beautiful Helen was the offspring of Zeus. And uh, let's go ahead and discuss the sources we used for this video. The sources used for our video include Professor Elizabeth Van Diver's great course lectures on the Iliad and Robert Fagel's excellent translation of the Iliad. The Penguin Classics edition of the Iliad includes an excellent introduction that further covers many of the topics we discussed in this video. You may not wish to read the Iliad straight through like a novel. Perhaps you want to listen to Miss Van Diver's lectures first. You can easily skip through the lists of the ships, but the battle scenes I found interesting Personally, I find the Iliad a joy to read. And also, we want to use as a source the Odyssey, and the sequel to the Iliad. And I mention that because many of the events in the Trojan War are referred to in the Odyssey. Such as the Trojan horse is not mentioned in the Iliad, but it is mentioned in the Odyssey. And additional stories about Helen. And, of course, we had the Iliad of Homer. This is uh, Elizabeth Van Diver's excellent 12 lecture course. Uh, there's also in the Great Courses Plus a series of lectures on the Greek literature and, and six of them are on Homer, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And this is a little bit duplicative of uh, Mrs. Van Diver's work, but it's still a good series of lectures to listen to. Please click on the link below for our blogs on the Iliad and the Odyssey and the, those, those links are in the description. And please click on the links for our other YouTube videos on the Iliad and other interesting videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.